Frank Favese, and uh, glad you all could come. Uh, glad that the weather cooperated amazingly, and that we arrived, just arrived from New Haven, where Elizabeth Walker lives. I just want to tell you a little bit about the world of Henry Orient. Well, it made a big impression on me when I was young, and it's a it's a comedy classic. What can I say? Peter Sellers, who you probably know from the Pink Panther movies, uh, was in it, starring in the role, which is a, really a story which is based on a, 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 novel, a, a, a book which was based somewhat on fact about a pianist, a concert pianist, and his name was Oscar Levant. And he was a very famous in, in all areas of, of the music world and show business, and he was a very well-known concert pianist. There was a young girl who had a crush on him and, and grew up to write this novel about two girls who follow this concert pianist around New York, and they're infatuated with him. And he uh, is totally paranoid and afraid that they're sent uh, you know, to spy on him because he's having affairs, numerous affairs. So every time he sees them, he goes into a panic. And uh, it's a delightful comedy. What, no, uh, Angela Lansbury is in it, a uh, very well-known actress, Paul Apprentice. And there was two newcomers, Mary Spaeth and Tippi Walker, which she was known by uh, then, two young unknown actresses to play these two girls. I think what no one expected was that one of these actresses played the role of Val, who was really infatuated with, with Henry, mostly, uh, stole the movie, okay, and gave a performance, which was her first performance in a, in a feature film, which really captivated everybody. And nobody expected that. And that performance really, to this day, remains probably one of the classic performances by a child actor in, in film. And uh, we are celebrating the 50th anniversary of this classic and this classic performance and, and artist. And uh, with the hope of passing it on, really, uh, many don't know the film. They know Peter Sellers. Um, the year is 1964. The Beatles are appearing on Ed Sullivan for the first time the Kennedy assassination, that whole era. And uh, really, we're, we're going to have a conversation with Elizabeth. We're going to show some clips from the film. I have learned by osmosis some of the film score, which I will at some point perhaps play on the piano there. And uh, I, we hope that you, you enjoy this uh, really wonderful opportunity uh, to, to get to know and have an encounter with this wonderful person, wonderful artist, Elizabeth T. Walker. Please give her a big welcome. <laughs> Hopefully, Arlen. You can't bring water here, so if anyone gets thirsty, please come down and you can have a nice drink. <laughs> there are probably more bottles in the back. Oh, this is a kind of a dream, so we'll try not to dream too far off, but it really is a great honor and pleasure to have you here to finally get a chance to meet you. How, how did you come to get this There's role a good in, story. in this movie? Okay. It's a good story, yeah. Um, I was in my family. My mother kept telling me how pretty I was. So, uh, you know, it's kind of like, yeah, but I can write, and I'm an artist, and blah, blah, blah. No, no, you're pretty, okay. So I thought, all right, I'll be a model. <clears throat> and um, in the 62, summer of 62, I tried miserable failure. I'm not very tall, and I'm not that pretty. So it was hard. And the next summer, my mother said, well, ask your friend Prudy if her sister will introduce you to her agents. And Missy Wilson is just God, so beautiful. Sure enough, yep. She's like, yes, I'll introduce you. So um, it was just yes, completely yes, 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 yes. This whole corridor of yeses. 
I went into New York City. It was the most beautiful Art Deco building on Park Avenue in the, in the 50s. <clears throat> I go up to their floor, and their whole wall is glass. You come out of the elevator, and it's glass there. And so there's these three women that have broken off from Plaza Five, which at the time was like Ford model agency, modeling agencies, and they, and they were just brilliant young women, very entrepreneurial. <clears throat> An older woman, um, a very artsy younger woman, and then this beautiful girl. And they took these models from Plaza Five, and there were all these great girls there. <clears throat> I had just been through a year at boarding school, and I had gotten away from my family. I had a really good time. <clears throat> and so, okay, I go in to meet these girls, and they, they see me coming out of the elevator, and they, and they just like come up to the door, and they're like, yeah, we'll take you. We don't have anybody like you. <clears throat> and so then um, I was a model. And um, I met these uh, photographers that lived in, or had their studio in this top floor of a building in Chelsea, this brick house. And the top floor, they, they were so smart. They were, Missy Wilson was there that day that I came in. And they took eight pictures of me. And they were all oh, great, great. And that's all they did. They, there were no muss, no fuss, no screaming, yelling, no problem. Just take the picture. OK, so then um, I got some work. And I worked for this guy named Howard Zeef, which I don't know if you know film, but he became quite a successful movie director. In those days, he was doing stills. So um, I did two jobs for him, one where I played the girl with the homework and the well, editorial modeling. That's the best modeling. You do the photograph next to the um, article. Yeah. So that's what I did for him. I played the schoolgirl, and, and he tried to describe process shot, but I couldn't get it. So OK. So, um, and then I did another job for him. And then I did one fashion job, which was the worst job. And then my favorite job of all um, was actually my first job. And um, I went down to the Regency Hotel ballroom, no, not ballroom, dining room, and <laughs> stood next to this handsome guy. I was 16. <laughs> I stood next to this handsome guy, looked demure, looked away. And this photographer, <clears throat> for about an hour and a half, took our picture. And you get paid for that. You know, I mean, it's just like, oh, man. $25 an hour, I got paid. I can't, I was so ecstatic. I would, I would go barefoot in Grand Central Station. I danced down the street. I was the happiest person in the world. I must, I could, I could compete for that. And um, OK, so and that's the long part. Then I didn't get work. Then I went out to the movies. I come home, and um, you have a job interview the next morning, 9 o'clock, um, for a movie. And um, girls in the office, they've worked in movies. They worked for like three days, sitting around in trees. And I thought, that'd be great. Fun, I'll play a student for three days. And because I wanted to keep doing what I was doing. And so um, turns out George and Jerry, the makers of Henry Orient, had been everywhere. They had been to my school. Um, they had been, they had cattle calls, which means that they just put a notice in the newspaper and people come to a place and they just look through hundreds and hundreds of people. They went to all the agencies. They called friends. They could not find a girl to play Val. And um, finally, OK, Howard Zeef. Jerry Hellman went down his high school address book, Howard Zeef, probably the last page, unless he went to the back first, and um, called him up. Do you know a girl who can play this role? Yes, I do. So that was the job interview I went in. Um, I think that's pretty incredible, <laughs> just like the very last minute, right? And um, so I went in, and there were girls there at 9 o'clock in the morning. And um, they called me first. I thought that was very rude. And um, I went in there and met them, and they gave me the script and asked me to read it. And when I came out, um, it was strange. I didn't really like the script. 
I mean, I thought Valerie's lines were rough, you know, and that's been the truth throughout my entire Hollywood acting career. Um, uh, it's very unfortunate. I, I was um, very um, uh, appreciative of very fine art, and I could write. So, um, and I, but I was very awkward as a person, as a, socially I was very, very rough. <laughs> and in acting, really, you kind of have to have it the other way. You have to be um, kind of not that um, particular about what you say and very smooth in how you behave. Were you prepared for the kind of reaction and the kind of sensation which your part played and what were the kind of notoriety that you got having come from where you came from? Well, it, um, I wasn't that, um, I just wanted it to be a, a different kind of notoriety. I always loved movies from the time I was tiny. We watched Million Dollar Movie every day. Yes, Million Dollar Movie. Every day I knew all the movie stars and when I was three and four, I knew them. And um, they used so to repeat them, right? That was the one special. Every day, show them. the same movie for a week. God forbid it be like a gangster movie. Or yes, right. You know, something. Yes. And um, so anyway. Well, the. But I know. I thought. I thought. You know. Okay. Yeah. We will be a success. But mm -hmm. I wanted to be successful as you know a beautiful girl. But they called Valerie a hoyden. Um. And um, and I didn't think she was that pretty. You know, I thought she was rough. You know, oh, she was so. Oh, I young. thought she was so pretty. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, not to mention the fact that she played piano. Yes, well. You I can under, You can relate to that. So you yes, know. Yes, uh, I know. A lot it, of musicians. Oh, wrote. did they? Were yeah. they impressed with that? Yeah. And, um, I, it wasn't me playing, but they. Yeah, I was disappointed. I think one I of the know. first things I asked you was, "Did you play piano, right?" Yeah. And said, no. Oh, Sorry, yeah. there goes an illusion, but yeah, um, too bad. Uh, <clears throat> now, the, it, but it, I always loved uh, great music. Always from the time I was very small. Great, My great music. grandmother was a founding member of the Metropolitan Opera Guild, and we always had, we always went in to watch the Philharmonic play and everything. Not, There's a lot of music in my family. The speaking of music. Uh, there is a beautiful film score by Elmer Bernstein. Yes, who, the best. best. So, it, and he uh, is not Leonard Bernstein, who you all know from West Side Story, but Elmer Bernstein. And they were actually, knew each other, were friends, and one concentrated more on film score. And it has the most delightful score. And before we get too far into things, would you like to hear a few That's tunes says, from, from excerpts says. from Henry Ory? <laughs>
to get to play that for Val. <laughs> That's quite something. Um, now, what would you like to do? Would you like to show, a, 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 we have a clip to show? Yeah, show the clip. Punks. was used in they held it up a little film. bit film nice i understood special effects yes what I, what, what i would like to play uh, is the concert i think that they would oh henry th that would be that would be great there is a the two girls attend a concert of henry's in carnegie hall and he is performing a new piece a new work uh, which uh, maybe the style of which you will recognize and uh, and I think it speaks for itself. that stuff Cole Porter writes.
to say one thing. Uh, when I was preparing for this afternoon, uh, a week ago, a couple weeks ago, I was home and I, I was thinking, I, I, I've never done anything like this before and it's so far removed from what, anything I've done. I don't know, a lot of the students know me from uh, doing the Hindemithon, and, and it's a festival of Paul Hindemith, the composer, and that's my big production for the year, and uh, his music is not known a lot. And uh, so it, it occurred to me that, uh, you know, about this concerto, I, was, I got curious about what the story was behind that, and apparently another, the composer, the, the composer of the film score, which I played, did not write that. It was written no. be before the, the, he was even hired. Really? Yes, and uh, they needed it, and they hired his I name. I met the young guy. Okay, Ken Lauber is his name, yeah. and uh, hired him just, he was working $75 a week uh, <laughs> and for some firm, and they said, can you want this gig? You can write a concerto for four minutes, it has to be, and it's a comedy, so he did it. And I, I was reading about that, and he said he felt so alone with the whole thing that nobody was helping him, nobody was telling him what to to do, uh, you know, there was nobody from the film. The director of the film, George Roy Hill, mm. was not there, and he said that would have been a big help to him because George Roy Hill had been a student of Paul Hindemith. <laughs> I thought that was that really floored me because I how how did that I didn't know nothing about that connection. So the the, the famous director George Roy Hill, you probably. I've seen Butch Cassidy and the Stun Sundance Kid. The Sting. Uh, the Sting. Uh, the World According to Garth. World According Slaughter to Slaughterhouse Five. Slaughterhouse yeah. Five. So uh, he had been a pianist, uh, studied piano at Yale. And, he was and a great, very good pianist. Okay, player. and very was good. a student of Paul Hindemith. I just had to interject that. I yeah. thought it was a funny yeah. coincidence. Mm -hmm. What uh, else? What else? <laughs> Well, it's just so much, isn't it? It's uh, overwhelming. It was a sacred event, that film. It was, yeah. You refer to it as your destiny in a way. It was my destiny, absolutely, yes. How is it to have that kind of destiny? I mean, is it to... I don't really know. It sort of redefines itself all the time, especially now. 50th year anniversary. I think so. I think it's a... We made it in 63, so last... This year was the 50th year. This year is the 50th year anniversary of the. But for my money, of all the films that I've ever seen, and I've seen a lot, um, it represents in feeling, in essence, um, the 60s more than any other film, more than um, um, Easy Rider, more than. Easy Rider, I think, is kind of a mean movie. You know, it's all about people hating each other and killing each other and being, you know, perverse, but it supposedly, you know, represents the 60s. But I think Henry Orient has that um, pollen, the essence of the 60s Im embedded in it more than um, any other film uh, that I've I seen. I totally agree. It's hard to define exactly what that is, but if you watch this film... Well, it's spiritual love is what it is. It is really. spiritual Love. It's like no holds barred, anything is possible at any given moment kind of idea. You know, you can do anything. <laughs> you put your heart and mind to something, you, you'd be surprised what you can accomplish. And let, let those um, avenues play. Let your heart and your mind really have their way. And the you'd be surprised what you can do. The Kennedy assassination happened. What was that relationship? Well, that was in relation to was the film. That was the, like the first big blow to, to that of the '60s. But it didn't stop it. No. No. The timing would have been what? This, the, the filming was completed before Kennedy was before, assassinated. Before, yeah, yeah, yeah. We completed in October. And uh, so that's a month <laughs> early. And it was filmed all in New York. In, in Greenwich Village? All over the city, 64th Street, um, all over Grand Central, I mean Central Park, mm -hmm. all over the place. Carnegie Hall. 
Carnegie Hall, of course, was yeah. recognized. Yeah, uh, just all over New York. Yeah. It's a real New York movie. A lot of, you can recognize a lot of sites from. Yeah. They're still there. Yeah, and George lived there. You know, he loved living there. Yeah. After you had that success, you went on to do other films. I did other things, but... Um, and television. It was almost like my career was doomed from the beginning. Because I just, I, well, God, from there I got this enormous agency. And they, they, are, they don't look at you, they don't care about you. It's like, um, let's see, you're what, five foot something, blonde, female, young, okay. <clears throat> you know, and they just like, you play that, you know, and I couldn't do that. I mean, you know, it had to be geared to me. And, um, you know, the more I read about, and, and you're, oh, is that so unprofessional? No, it's not unprofessional. It's logical, you know? I mean, why would you want to do something that you hate? How crazy, are, you know, at, what, at, at 17 years old, 18, you're gonna play a role you hate? Yeah, that goes over really well, you know? Um, <laughs> You get out there and you're like with a whole bunch of strangers and they're desperate, you know, everybody in the industry, like any other industry really, if you think about it, unless you're like happily scrubbing floors you know, somewhere, even then, you know, it's like, oh, you know, did I leave you know, one piece of grime, you know, it's like, oh, yeah, yeah. Um, everyone's just frantic now, but they were then too, of course. What was I thinking? But um, no, I, I never was comfortable with a role ever, not one time. Uh, with this particular role? <laughs> so I now write and act my own stuff. So I did seven musical clown acts in, in, in um, New Haven. Didn't hear about it. I did them. They were good. Four performances, four. That's all you get. And um, it was great. I loved doing it. Um, and I'm writing a screenplay. Okay, you want to tell yeah. us a bit about that? I, well, or is it it's very mystical. It has a lot of mystical stuff in there because that's what I like. Um, yeah, I, I'm very, um, I've always been spiritual, always my whole life. Lots of, and I, I find atheism one of the most tragic, um, misguided ideas of our world. Yeah, and so my screenplay is going to represent um, uh, the spiritual interaction with this plane in a big way. Yeah. It seems to me a very <laughs> interesting movie would be of your life but to have gone through that. My and life. It's <laughs> going to, yes, well, yeah, the, I, I have a character for myself. I see. So it yes. is autobiographical. Well, it's going to have um, an artist living in the ghetto. I see. Yeah, interacting and you know, um, going through New Haven and kind of like, of not probably even like mentioning Yale one time, yeah. except to ride by those august buildings and you know, see a lot of students, I suppose. Yeah, yeah. That, what you were talking about. Go ahead. Did you want to say something? Um, I didn't want to cut you off. No. What you were saying about pursuing your dream and yeah. and being able the whole thing that was so seemed to be so present present in the sixties. <laughs> what advice would you give to the young students and and that and dealing with? Okay, well, it's really a spiritual path. That's what I'm going to tell you. You'll you'll be like, yeah, right. Well, and in fact, it is. If you look throughout history um, and you see all of like the really tense moments, people come out of nowhere. Like, okay, really boring, you know, horrible reference. Um, but unfortunately, one of the great, incredible figures of our, of our country is Abraham Lincoln. How the hell did he get to be pregnant, president? <laughs> or maybe that would have been. Never did get pregnant. <laughs> <laughs> that would have been. Similar. Yeah, that would have been really something else. But I mean, well, God, to come out of nowhere and like save us. Um, the 60s is actually a, um, a spiritual revolution. Uh,
It connected us up with Zen and <coughs> Brahmanism, I suppose it is. It's okay. Certainly. Uh, and the natives. The natives, big deal. Yeah. yeah. Um, you and had. Anyone of faith or honesty or, or real value well, came out during those years. There's Anybody with a really great idea was heard. And, you know, the music. And pursuing those ideas was also happening too along with you think of the Beatles and their search and what they were doing and, and all of the incredible stuff that's gone into um, shutting it down during the 80s and 90s yeah yeah certainly feminism just you know like get rid of those people you know they're liars and cheaters and you know just uh, stupid stuff and unfortunately my co-star Mary uh, she was very much involved yes. with Took a different path. She really liked, when you see us jumping, you know, she's like got stars in her eyes and she's looking up and she's like, yeah, you know. She knows, she's, she's just got this incredibly clear road to like money and fortune and <laughs> fame and power. And me, I'm going like, yeah. <laughs> so you really so, were more like Val in that regard. And, and, she, and was she was more like. That's kind of interesting. Any other experiences you had during the making of the film? And Angela Lansbury you worked with, was it? That was a really funny thing. Um, Angela had just finished making um, The Manchurian Candidate. Oh, that's a... She played a very scary woman in that film. And there she is playing my mother, you know? <laughs> and she was kind of scary. She's very old Hollywood. She married to an agent, Peter Shaw. Yes, yeah. And... Um, so that kind of worked and your acting, I guess, it would help you to, to be a little bit intimidated by I this? Was, yeah, she was, I, <laughs> I handled it very well when I was younger. How is that that you bring... I was used to scary adults. Scary adults. I'm very used to them, yeah. You, how, what about... I was raised among, um, you know, Westchester County yeah. suburbanites, and those people are scary. There's no more f terrible fear than walking into the American Yacht Club dining room. You know, I'd rather ride my bike at midnight through the ghetto than walk into that room. I would. You? Seriously, those people are very, very frightening. <laughs> they don't have to do anything. Oh. You, <laughs> you, you really were that gut I girl. I was that girl, yeah. Hmm. Except um, I gave up piano. But I was a writer and an artist. Yeah, so it was very was obvious, because I was very sophisticated artistically, but backward socially. So, And plus, I was playing a 14-year-old, so that was perfect. Is that what really makes art great when your personal, when your... What's his name? Lester Bangs said the only uh, true currency in this bankrupt world is what we say to each other when we're uncool. Isn't that what he said? Okay. And almost famous. Mm -hmm. Philip Seymour Hoffman, yeah. Yes, we just lost the great movie great, and great stage actor. actor. What occurred to me right away was a lot of actors are going to go back to work. Oh, he had a lot of roles. <laughs> he did a lot of stuff, Why? a lot. It, if nothing illustrates the limits of fame and fortune, I don't think. The vulnerability. The vulnerability. He had no idea what he was doing, I don't think. No idea. Yeah, yeah. I but I have a thing I say as a mystic. Life is too personal to be either caused or, sorry, death is too personal to be either caused or prevented, but our lives have their effects. I think it's a, it's a spiritual inevitability. You just go from one plane to the next. You can't prevent that. You can't avoid that. That's my belief. Yeah. Well, I mean... Uh, and that kind of takes the sting out of death, too. I don't like all of the atheistic ideas that accompany all these sort of grief-ridden movies. There is no death. There's no such thing. But I think it's terrible to waste your life, too. It is. But you don't. You can't. You can't waste your life. There's no way you can waste your life. There's always valuable. Always something very deep and good going on. 
even if it's to you know show what is do you think of how many of you are planning on going so into huge. film any acting or acting I, or performing no we're more musicians today yeah uh, well, well just don't let anybody push you around and play what you love no matter what even if you have to get nasty <laughs> It's part of it, right? To stand up for yourself. Sometimes, as a female actress, female, oh, I hate that word, God. A friend of mine uses it a lot. But nonetheless, uh, um, as an actress when I, in the 60s, I really thought I should be able to say, you know, like a few things about what I was doing. And it was so scorned <laughs> upon, it was weird. And I was from a family where, you know, girls were supposed to be so nice. The pressures were ridiculous. It was just stupid. But you must. You have to do, stand up for yourself if you don't have somebody else that can do it for you, and you really don't. There's no one else who can stand up for you like you. Nobody. And even if people, you know, will turn away from you and tell you you're neurotic or, you know, God forbid you be unpleasant or, you know, opinionated or smart. You know, you try and do it anyway. It's very hard to be yourself, but it's the best possible thing. I live in a, a very rough neighborhood, but I'm very glad I do. I live on a street, they have Hasidic Jews on one side, blacks, gay men and poor white people on the other side. And um, I have had two friends murdered in the last four years. And um, I love them. I love those people. I love those guys. They're so <sighs> courageous. It takes a lot of nerve to be alive right now. And it's going to take a lot more nerve, I think, if we don't deal with some things. You really haven't used your notoriety uh, like many actors do. No, I don't think it's important. You do it more as a citizen, as a, just a no, person. Your, your knowledge and your eloquence is far more important than your big name or whatever you might have done. If you're a legendary, so you, you haven't had the urge to, to do that, make that connection with that. No. And, uh, <laughs> Not unless, no. No. Uh, yeah. No, Valerie Boy. I mean, she's a nice character. Very yeah. nice character. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you plan to do any acting yourself in future films? Are you, I've heard rumors that. Maybe. Maybe. A return to the screen. Sort of like Dwayne Hickman. I'm still waiting for that other one. Dwayne Hickman? Dobie Gillis? Yeah. Oh, okay. He's still waiting for his, <laughs> his second role. You have a different place, I think. <laughs> but. Uh, I love no. that show. Yeah, it was a great show. Man yeah, Tuesday Crab. Well. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, that's true. Yes, yeah. that's right. Yeah. yeah. What happened to Tuesday Well? Is she married? She got old and fat. Pink and Zuckerman, I think, is violinist. Like people do. <laughs> <laughs> uh, She's still brilliant somewhere. Oh, God. Well, we have been honored to have you. So nice of you to yep. stay. Oh, no. no. <laughs> I, I think uh, we all enjoyed it and, you know, <laughs> Uh, we hope to see you perhaps on stage or in film and uh, not just doing the good citizen thing, but sharing your art because you are an yeah, enormously... I'm sorry, I didn't bring anything to give you all. You're an enormously gifted actress and I think... Okay, I have one short poem. A poem? Okay. Yeah. It's very, very short. Yes. Okay. <clears throat> Let's see. The beautiful visionary does not turn away from hardship and the plague, but turns everything into the good land. Beautiful. That's my Thank you.